Good morning. Look at this audience out there this morning. Amen. Who's, who's hungry for a chocolate chip cookie? Right? I would hand them out, but COVID prevents me from doing that. So you guys, you guys, you just get to look. Wait, what if you're okay with that? What if you're okay if I do that? Right? I was told earlier that I never only passed out to the front row, so somehow I have to figure out how to fling this all the way to the back, right? And not hurt somebody. But um, can you, could you just smell the wafting cookies when you came in this morning? No. Isn't there something special about walking into a house and you just smell something fresh baked, bread, dessert? You're like, pass wrong. We got to get out here early. I'm always wanting to go to Wawa, right? Like, come on. This is what we're talking about this morning in um, homemade is home sweet home. Uh, what is the aroma of home? Now, the whole gist of this is learning to build with your words. Build a sweet environment with your words. We'll give you the challenge, this week's challenge at the end of the message. Uh, but while you're sort of gathering your notes and getting ready, I want to make you aware of a resource we have in the back. Um, we did this with V-Day, but obviously this one's different. Uh, should be out in the lobby. You can go out there. And, and, and what this is is just sort of a sneak peek at some of the sermons, little tidbits of future sermons coming. Um, the staff has written little articles with tips and resources and we, on the back and in the middle. We just sort of have an at-a-glance look at upcoming ministries um, that are offered during this month. So this is more specific to um, uh, September. Just pick that up. And I do believe it'll be made available online digitally um, and so forth. But let me talk to you for just a moment about something that many of you maybe heard but maybe not heard a, a lot about in a while. Speaking of Build My Life, that song, Build My Life, Open Up My Eyes to See the Wonder. Uh, so we, are, we have a thing called the Wonder Project. Many of you are probably wondering what that is. In short, the Wonder Project is a building campaign at, at its core. And it's providing space for our children's ministry, which will double as a space for our, our, our Waterstone Academy lower campus. It's providing space for our student ministry, which will double as space for our upper campus for Waterstone Academy. It, it's building our broadcast ministry. And right now, we're going to pause and pray for in, in just a moment. Um, but it's just as, as this thing really begins to be, just take off and blessed, uh, the broadcast ministry. And we're, by that, we mean going live online. We, need, we mean our digital media, media strategy, all of that. Uh, just recently in the last few weeks, just little things have begun to fail. Like one minute we're live at 9 a.m. and the next minute we're not. So you guys are live, right? Right? So we're live with you all. But that has been a tremendous ministry. Um, it is what has brought us, carried us through. Um, today we have a new member of Stepping Stones class, and it is full again. This is our third or fourth month of a full new membership class. Uh, so, yeah, amen. Many of them have messaged us and said, we've been watching you online. It's, it's what sort of brought us to this point, what's gotten us through. And this is the, uh, the decision that we're going to make. But listen, the Wonder Project, and even when I say it, it causes me to pause. What I mean by that, it's, it's, a, it's, it's aggressive. But I know, I know, I know, I know. So I want to define some things for you. When I stand up here and I say, this is where I feel like spending the rest of my life. When I use the word 35 years, that terminology, how Rain and I feel like our calling is fulfilled is when we're in our 80s or 90s or whatever and Raina still looks pretty but I'm slobbering, right? When that happens, we know that we will have fulfilled our... We know this. We know this for sure. We know we will have fulfilled our calling that we will hear, Lord willing, well done, thy good and faithful servant. I don't say that for us, but I, we will have fulfilled our calling if the Wonder Project comes to completion. We firmly believe that down deep. But just because it's 35 years from now doesn't mean we're not going to be taking steps. As a matter of fact, we're aiming for the end of October, hopefully by the end of the year, to bring to you our first step. I mean, literally, the Wonder Project is, is a Jordan Crossing, Jericho walking project. It literally is. It is Jordan walking through the, the rivers that God has parted. It is facing those immediate sort of battles in the culture that we live, and it's providing the education that is needed. When, when you hear of the educational model framework that we have, as I've shared this with many who are in the educational system, they're like, this is, this is groundbreaking. This is, we've never had anything like this. It's a phenomenal educational model. Our broadcast ministry is, is we want to take this international and, and it's not just the preaching of the word, it's encouraged media. It's so many different forms of media that come out of the word of God. 
It is a ministry that we're going to call Reclamation. Reclamation is the, the international global tool that takes what we're doing here and makes Waterstone ground zero for discipleship making. As you may know, in, in my own prayer life and time, I've been struggling in certain areas. And finally, God said, why are you struggling in that area? Here's what I want you to focus. And it's, it's going after the, what you would call the 10% committed Christians across the country and training and developing them. It's like, why have I been training churches now for almost 10 years? Why have I been doing that? God, what, what, what is the reason behind that? What are the lessons that we've learned in all of these elements of discipling the family, training the family, starting right now, which is why we're in this family series. It's not just to give you good tips on how to be better parents or grandparents or how to be better students or children. It's a reminder that God only gave us two institutions, the family and the church. The family and the church. And the church should celebrate the family and the family should be a part of the church. And the church should be sort of catapulting the family into culture. If there ever was a time for something like the Wonder Project. Now it's aggressive. When I say aggressive, we're talking $25, $30 million aggressive. And our property, if you didn't know it, if you parked out on that parking lot, you know our property is the Jordan River. <laughs> and if there's one thing that bugs me, I mean, when I say bugs me, like I, when, when it rains, I go, good Lord, these people are, they're, they're going to. So I'm praying for the day that we walk to church on dry ground, <laughs> crossing the Jordan River. That literally is my prayer that we walk through on dry ground, whether it's sand or gravel or concrete, something other than muck and mush, right? I come to church with two different pairs of shoes. I don't know if you do that. I literally walk into the church with one pair and put on another because I don't want my shoes to look all dirty and nasty and muddy when I'm standing up here. I'm like, come on, God. Just And God's like, you're going to cross that Jordan River, right? And we're praying for dry ground. But I want you to keep your eye and your ears open, prayerful about the Wonder Project. We, God is just opening amazing doors through this opportunity. And this is why we're preaching family. This is why we're celebrating what we're celebrating. So keep your ears and eyes open for what you hear, um, the Wonder Project. So we're home sweet home. And I'm going to read uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. And it should be on the screen or you can follow me. And if, again, if you're not really quite sure where Colossians is, it's sort of a little acronym, uh, GEPC, General Electric Power Company, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, kind of helps. It's in the IAN section of the New Testament uh, kind of a thing. So uh, I'm going to be reading two verses that are close to each other, and they, they sound similar. And, but I want to read both of them. Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. Listen to the Bible. The Bible says, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Okay? Which is why we're talking about home sweet home, using encouraging words. Back up to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. The Bible says almost the same thing. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up. In the discipline, key word, and instruction, another key word of the Lord. So let's talk about this morning. What does it mean to build a home sweet home? Let me ask you a question. Why did God give us families? Why did God give us families? Well, we know from the scriptures why. First of all, for living together. We know that. God gave us families for living together. Yes, thank you. You, you, you guys can see that. For living together. For also for learning together. We see that right there in those two verses. And we're going to look at multiple this morning. And for lasting. This again is the whole reason. One of the many reasons behind the Wonder Project. is It's from generation to generation. Joshua chapter 24 verse 15. The most often used verse on Father's Day. But as for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. Now if you go back and study Joshua 24. And then jump forward to, to Judges chapter 2. They're, they're back to back books. You'll quickly learn that it only took one generation from Joshua 24 to Judges chapter 2 verse 10. One generation to where the Bible records there is now a generation that never saw nor knew the hand of God. We have to be very intentional about not just raising our house for now. Well, when Rain and I became parents, we greatly realized that it's not just about our children right now. We're praying for their children. We're praying for their children. We're praying for their children. It's generational. What you're doing right now, make no mistake about it. What you're doing with your family right now, what you're experiencing in your family dynamic right now is not just for right now. It's for the generations. And have we not seen that just, just in the political climate, just in cultural climate, in doctrinal climate? Have we not seen how quickly times have changed 
And you and I have forgotten what it means to make a generational impact. So let's, let's talk about this. How do we make a home sweet home? How do we build this environment with our words, with our actions, with our attitudes? That's like when you walk in and you smell chocolate chip cookies. You smell that fresh baked pie. Like you just love, absolutely love being home. How do you build a home sweet home? Number one, let's look at what I call the aroma of love. The, the aroma of love. Again, building off that idea of the smell of cookies and pies and, and coming home. And how do you do that? Well, th- these are sprinkled all throughout the, the Word of God. So we're going to touch on them this morning. But they primarily come principles that come from Ephesians 3. And again, uh, Ephesians 6 and Colossians 3. Number one, here you go. You have to have what we call a loving touch. A loving touch. Well, what do we mean by that? I mean, you, you can't touch your children enough. You can't touch each other enough. We, we like that. Did we not discover that how awkward that was to not be able to touch it when COVID hit? I mean, it was like, really? Remember the first few weeks, you're like, fist, this, air, what, what do I do from a distance? And now, they, now, now the word contactless is so popular, right? All the restaurants say it's contactless service, contactless this, and contactless that. I can't imagine going through life contactless. You and I weren't, weren't made for that. We were made to be around each other. We were made for each other, and each other were made for us. We were made for community. We were made to encourage each other through touch. So were your children. So was your spouse. So was your family. And again, let me remind you, as we're working through this, and you're going, well, we're not the typical family. Uh, we no longer have preschoolers and teenagers, and we're empty nesters, or, or we're married, or we, we don't have children at all. Or No matter where you find your dynamic, your family dynamic, this isn't just about the family. These are principles from the Word of God on how to build with your words. It doesn't take you long to get on social media to find out people don't know how to be nice on social media. And if there ever was a culture and a time in culture where we need to learn what it means to be sweet with our words, the Word of God is teaching us how to do that. What do we, what do we mean by loving touch? Hug them affectionately. Hug them affectionately. Hug them supportively. Hug them tenderly. And hug them playfully. These are all the areas that, that you, sort of, you sort of show that love and, and, and appreciation and encouragement You can't give enough hugs. You can't give enough touch. You can't give enough contact, which is why this contactless society really just bothers many of us. Now, there are some people that are like it, right? The extreme introvert and so forth. They're like, this is awesome. I love contactless. I like keep this. No, but for most of us, right, there's this idea of loving touch. Here's the other one the Bible speaks of, loving encouragement. Loving encouragement. This is the aroma of love. It's, it's, It's loving affection. It's loving encouragement. It's saying words like, I believe in you. I believe in you. Now, here's what's interesting. We celebrate athletes who, let's say a Major League Baseball player is considered very successful when they hit .300, right? If if I'm accurate, that's like right around 30%. And and yet we expect our kids to do everything 110% right the first time. But yet you are considered successful in, ath- in, in athletics if you're at least 30% successful. Think about that for just a moment. Many of your kids are already major league stars. You've just not recognized it. Many of them are, are and listen, Ron and Raina, we've gone through this. More Ron than Raina. You know, my wife's the type of person, if you're running over her with a car, she's like, oh, you have nice tires, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's, bless her, I mean, she really is. I mean, I'm being totally honest. I'm like, if you're running over me with a tire, I'm praying for the car to blow up as soon as you get outside of me, right? I mean, two totally different priorities. We're not live, are we? But I'm just picking on myself. But you know what I mean? And, and so, listen, I understand not everybody's like that. We've had those challenges uh, in our marriages, of, uh, in our raising children, of Raina teaching me what it means to speak sweet words and supportive words and encouraging words and kind words. Because I can be that kind of dad where I'm like, listen, we told you once, we told you, you know, you know right? I can be that. And so it's learning to be sort of encouraging with your words. Remember, what we're working on is learning how to build with our words. How often have you said to your spouse to your children, to others, that I believe in you? How often have they heard those words? When's the last time you heard those words from somebody? Like, I believe in you. You can do this. God made you. You're, you're going to get there. Like, you're going to make it. Like, it's going to be all right. When is the last time you just hugged your family and hugged your children affectionately, supportively, tenderly, playfully, and at the same time said, I believe in you. I see potential in you. 
you can make this. Yes, when it comes to our kids, you know, I think with each of my kids, I've told them, I'm like, you're like Michael Phelps choosing to swim in the bathtub. You know what I mean? Like, you have no idea how talented you are. Like, you, if, if your talent is, is that you're a two by four right now, but you have a 12 by 24 capacity, kind of, you don't see that in yourself right now. And maybe my words maybe aren't communicating that, but I need you to know right now, this is what I see in you. Number three, loving ears. It's not always about maybe necessarily the action that we do. Maybe it's the action that we don't do that's obvious. It's, it's saying words like, I understand. Like, I'm listening to you. Like, I, I, I hear you. I understand you. Now, stereotypically, um, when it comes to communication, guys are problem solvers. Stereotypically, not always, right? Stereotypically, guys are problem solvers. So stereotypically, when a guy is hearing a situation from his wife or from his children... The guy's automatically, he, he's kind of listening, but he's already devised this blueprint plan. Like, you can do this and do that. I'm telling you right now, I've already listened to you in 30. I can solve your problem in 30 seconds. Number one, number two, number three, A, B, C, D, done. Like, why, why, are, we, why are we even talking? Like, why, why, why we even go any longer? And, and guys, have you ever been here? Has your wife or your children ever said, I really didn't want you to give me an answer. I just wanted you to listen. Don't raise your hand, right? And wife, don't look around and go, see, I told you that was wrong. Don't do that. We're talking about how to build with our words. We want to practice that uh, this morning. But stereotypically, when it comes to communication, one of the partners, and even between your children, like I see it in my own children, sometimes they'll come in and talk, and, and one child's already diagnosing the problem, and the other kid's going, I, I know the diagnosis is coming, and I don't want it. I don't want to hear it, right? The Bible, sometimes you don't need to give a diagnosis. Sometimes you just need to say, I hear you. Even if you don't understand, sometimes saying, I understand. Because even though the feelings may not be real to you, the, re the feelings are real to them. Even though the situation not, may not be real to you, that situation is real to them. And at that moment, what you're seeking to do is you're, you're seeking to understand. Raina likes it. She often asked me to share this little, little ditty I heard a while back. And it, it goes something like this. Maybe you ever heard it. There once was an owl who lived in an oak. The more he heard, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Why can't we be like that wise old bird? In other words, we have how many ears and how many mouths? Some of you are going, I got eight mouths. No, you don't. You have one, right? <laughs> You're like, well, I, I'm, I can beatbox. I can do 18 different sounds out of my mouth at once. Okay, whatever. No, you still have more ears than you have, than you have mouths. Loving ears. Here's the next one and the last one. Loving prayers. Loving prayers. Right now, mom and dad, right now, each other. Think through your prayers right now. How many of your prayers are loving prayers for someone else? How many of your prayers are loving prayers for someone else? Like, again, it's okay. We've discovered prayer, and we've discussed prayer enough. It's okay in your prayer life to go to God with your supplications and requests. 1 Thessalonians 5. We know that. It's okay to go to God and say, God, I need guidance for this. I need an open door for a job, a medical diagnosis, a doctor's appointment, financial. It's okay to go to God with your supplications, with your request. It's okay to go to God with sort of thanksgiving, right, and all of that. But how many of us in our prayer time actually have a section of our prayer time where our prayer time is a loving prayer for somebody else? Like, God, I want to thank you for them. God, I want to thank you for this area because if not, what we often do is we often see the areas of somebody else's life that we hope changes. And something steps into their life to change that about them. Rather than we spend time thanking God for the things that we do appreciate about them. But not only that, have you learned to develop a loving prayer life for them? Like, God, this is what I pray for for my children. This is what I pray for for my spouse. This is what I pray for my neighbor. This is what I pray for my community, my workers, my life group. All of those areas of life, learning to develop loving prayers. All of this adds to the aroma of the home. Often people, you know, ask, they're like, Pastor Ron, you know, you, you seem so busy or this and that and that. You know, you need some time. Listen, my time off is six inches within my front door is when I feel like I'm on vacation. For the most part, we don't really need to go anywhere. I mean, we do, and, and we can, but, but for the most part, as soon as I get home, we have always tried our best to build this home sweet home that as soon as we come home, 
That's where life happens. Life may feel like it happens out there, but six inches inside my front door, boom. That's where I know I'm safe. That's where I know I'm encouraged. That's where I know I'm loved. That's where I know I can just, I can be me. I can be Ron. I, we can be Rain and we can be our family. That is our resort. There's something special about coming home. And these are the elements of that. You and I need to learn how to build this, what we call the aroma of love. And, and what do you do? You give out sweet samples. It's so funny. We were talking about this, this cookie, and we were talking with you know, some folks in the back of how they love to go to Costco. Anybody else go to places like Costco to get the samples? Right? You, you, know, you know what they're going to serve. And inevitably, the good stuff there's a line for, and all the other stuff, like liquid laxative, or kind of like, it's like nobody's in line for that. Right? Like, who wants to take liquid laxative at Costco? Anyway, right, I'm also glad we're not live at 9 because I had no idea I was going to say that. But whatever. My wife's texting me probably right now going, don't use the liquid laxative illustration at 11. I don't know. Let me, let me talk about sweet samples. What are some sweet samples out there? There's the taste of encouragement. Now, now let me just go ahead and give you all of these. The taste of encouragement, the taste of responsibility, the taste of empowerment, and the taste of accountability. Now, now why do we say these are all taste? Because, number one, you and I can't always take massive doses of responsibility at once. We can't take massive doses of accountability. I mean, we can encouragement. But there's another reason why we're learning to give out these sweet samples. Because the words that we use to others are often the words that they'll use to others. Come on, now, you know you've been in a situation where little kids, two, three, four years old, and they throw out some kind of language at a store and you're like, that little kid didn't know that language unless they heard it somewhere. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? They're like, yeah, they just didn't read that in today's little educational book. Like somebody near them dropped that word or dropped that phrase. That's why they knew that. That's what I mean. Even at the earliest of age, start dropping samples of encouragement. Teach them what it means. If you want your children to re respond and behave a certain way, you respond and behave a certain way. If you want your children to grow up and live and be something, you live and be that model in front of them. You show them what it looks like. Show them what it tastes like. Give them samples of encouragement, samples of responsibility. Because you, you and I know we've been there, right? That as, as much as we can guard them and protect them and pray over them, at some point when they're out from among us, they're going to be out there in that world. And that world is not going to be as loving, encouraging, and supportive as us. And so we have to sort of build this in them. Begin now teaching your kids, even at a very young age, a sense of responsibility. Bring them into that. Don't just do everything for them. Bring them into that. A, a taste of empowerment. Like let your kids do some things, even if they absolutely fail. Even if they absolutely fail, just let them do it. Now, early on, obviously, set up the right environment for them to fail. Like, they don't know you're setting up that environment for them to fail. And I'm like, early on, Rain and I, you know, she did. She learned this trick to, like, set up a mock trip to the mall kind of a thing. You know, get the kids ready. Like, all right, we're going to go to the mall or the grocery store. And she wasn't really going to do it. But we, we knew in the challenging age at the time that if our kids sort of, sort of rebelled or acted up or did anything, she's like, all right, done. We're going home. You see, if we, if we have to go to the grocery store and we say, if you do this, we're going to turn around and go home. And down deep inside, you're going, I hope they don't do it because we really do need milk. <laughs> been there? Somebody's laughing. They've been there. And like, I, I hope we really do need And you're in the store and you're trying your best not to lose it, right? You know, and, and, and they're still, but the, the kid registered it in their head. Well, I did that and we didn't go home. So the next time you say, you hang, you do this one more time and we're going to go home. And they're going, all right, let's test this theory. Kids are smart little suckers. They're like that Jurassic Park movie that came out. They put up all the fence and the dinosaurs kept testing the weak areas of the fence. They're little dinosaurs. They're going to test the weak areas of the fence and find out where they can get through. Very early on, those little kids are a lot smarter than what you and I give them credit for. But set them up for opportunities where you almost create an environment where you know they're going to fail, but you teach them through that. Because you know out in the world they're going to fail. You and I fail every day, right? Do you not? Am I the only one that failed? No, we fail every day and give them a taste of accountability. Start teaching them that every choice has a consequence. Choices and consequences. Two C words you, you should use over and over and over in your household. Choices and consequences. Every choice 
has a consequence. You're free to choose your choice, but you're not free to choose your consequence because there is a natural consequence to every choice. Begin teaching them that. That is what we call the aroma of love. Number two, you got to pick the dessert. Number two, it's, it's, it's sort of picking the dessert. It, it, this goes right in with what I was saying, was sort of build that, in, that natural environment for success and failure. Now, this isn't just for your children. It's also for your marriage. And it's also for every environment, every relationship. Now, for just a moment, forget that we're talking about parenting. How awesome would our relationships be if there was already this aroma of love? If there was this, this idea of picking the right dessert? How much better would our relationships be? And by the way, what is the one thing Jesus said the world would know that we are his disciples if we have love for one another? This isn't just for kiddos. This isn't just for grandparents and aunts and uncles. This is for every relationship that you have. So let's talk about how do you, how do you pick the dessert. Understand this. You actually, you actually liberate your children by limiting your children. You actually, the Bible said that. The Bible spoke to you and I that you and I are by discipline and instruction. This is how we prevent our children from having outbursts of immaturity, insecurity, and anger. Now, most parents are like, you know what? I don't want to limit my child. I mean, I just need to, I'll put down 50,000 toys in front of them and let them choose. Mistake. You need to put down two toys with them and just let them learn how to play with those two. And how many of you have gone out at Christmas, you couldn't wait to celebrate the gift you got, and they played with the box? And you're like, they didn't even play with a toy. They play with a box. Like, I could have just bought the box, Right? How many of you have been there? But the Bible teaches that you and I actually liberate our children by limiting them. Listen to this. Life is made sweeter when I understand that every choice has a consequence. And it will be the same. One pastor years ago said, your, your children can be disciplined at your hand or by the hand of a judge. You choose which one. And if you discipline your children by your loving, encouraging hands, the chances of them being sort of judged in the legal system are less. So you and I make this mistake all the time. I just, I just want to just let my children just choose. No, you don't. You need to show them what the right choices are to make. Listen to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13. This ought to be burned into every parent's mind. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. The Bible speaks of restraint. Believe it or not, your your children want restraint. I'm telling you, believe it or not, they want that. Of course they're going to rebel against that. Of course they're going to sort of flex their muscles and do that. But a child feels loved. A child feels encouraged when they know the boundaries of love to operate within. Did you know even pets operate this way? Can I just reduce this? This lesson right now, I can take this lesson right now and I can full on put this into training a healthy dog. I really can. Because even pets, pets don't want to just run feet. Pets want boundaries. And if your pets need that, so much more your children need that. Listen, when God gave you your family, for the most part, in his mind, it was already fashioned and shaped and molded. But for you and I, it is being fashioned, it is being shaped, and it is being molded. What we learn from our Heavenly Father are the same principles we put in our earthly home. One of the requirements for a minister, and the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy, that he must manage his own household well. Now, I remember learning those requirements and going through ordination. I can tell you one of my first thoughts were, oh, wow, what if my kids are ever unruly? What if they're ever disobedient? What if they're ever this or that? Does that disqualify me from being a pastor? No. Here's what that means. Because the Bible knows your children are going to be unruly. They're going to be undisciplined. They are going to be disobedient. That's not what that means. Here's why that principle was put in there. Listen, the same principles I as a pastor learn in how to manage a family are the same principles I use in managing a church. The same principles you are learning in managing a family are the same principles you take for life. Your home is your learning pad and your launch pad for ministry and for life and business and success. 
That's why God gave us Deuteronomy chapter 6. That's why he's given us the family. That's why he's given us the church. Those two things go hand in hand. So the better you and I learn how to relate to him and hear from him, the better we learn how to be a father, a mother, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, a husband, a wife in community and life group. You and I can build this aroma of love. We now know how to pick the right dessert. Listen, a failure to place boundaries on a child actually communicates rejection not freedom. Because here, here's what you need to know. If you don't conquer your child's will, somebody else will. Somebody else will. Your children are looking to be defined. They're looking for someone to speak encouragement and hope and acceptance and freedom. They're looking for someone to provide that to them. If you don't conquer your child's will, someone or something else will. Psalm chapter 11, verse 3. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? What is he speaking of there? The foundations that are spoken of here are the, are the principles of living the word of God through the context of family. The family has always been under attack. As I told you from the very first moment that Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, that first sibling rivalry didn't end very well. I mean, the family has been under constant attack. And if you're not familiar with this new show, which I haven't seen it, I've tried my best to study about it, called Cuties on Netflix. I mean, it is basically now putting pedophilia on display. And so you need to be aware. Our families are under, absolute under attack. Somebody wants to define and shape and speak some form of life into your family. You need to be the one that defines life for them as it is contained in the Word of God. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 27 says, Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Every time I hear parents say, like, I don't want to force religion on my child. I just want them to, to pick for themselves. That just makes me cringe. That's what this verse means. You're literally handing your child something like fire. And expecting them to hold it close to their chest and not be burned. What are you consuming in your own life? What are you carrying in your own life? Well, what is it that is around your own life that your children look at and they say, Well, if mom and dad can carry that kind of fire, then I can too. You and I need to learn these lessons. Pick the right dessert for them. In other words, you're showing them choices and consequences. You're showing them boundaries. And this goes for all of our lives. If there ever is one thing that holds me accountable as a father, it's being married and having children. Amen? Because this don't do as I don't do as I do, do as I say, that really doesn't work. That they're gonna do both. They're gonna do as you do and they're gonna do as you say. And no matter what you say, whatever they see you do, they're gonna follow that, right? And so you and I need to learn how to sort of pick the right dessert. Here's number three. You and I need to practice what I call chocolate noses, giggles, and roses. It's just having that time when you make dessert and, and the dessert comes out horrible. I mean, you're just like, we can't eat this, but you just have fun with it anyway, right? You just take the batter that was destroyed and you just kind of put it on their nose. And you're like, well, we can't really eat it, so we're going to make face paint out of it. I don't know, right? It's learning to laugh and it's learning to bless because here's what happens. Attitude, attitude is what builds a home sweet home. Is that not true? Attitude is what builds a home sweet home home no matter how good things look if it tastes bad have you ever had that experience i mean it looks good coming out and you look at it and you're like man i could eat and then all of a sudden you eat you dive into it and you're like i don't know what happened i've been making the same recipe at home it's so funny that this happened this week i've been making the same recipe at home i don't know for like eight years nine years ten years the same recipe and I, I did this meal the other night, and I tasted it, and it had no flavor. And I'm like, what in the world? I threw like half a pound of every spice in there. Why does this happen? I still can't figure it out. And so I, I, I said, maybe, come on, you guys just, and we had people come and tell like, yeah, it, that has no flavor. Like, it, it's, and I don't know, we just kept adding stuff and adding stuff. It, it looked the same, and it was funny. It, it, and they all said it, and I had no idea I was going to use this during the message, but uh, I think most of them went out to the garage or somewhere and come back in. And here's the first thing they said after I started getting it corrected. They go, well, it smells better. <laughs> right? You remember that? It's like now, now it actually smelled like what it should be. But sometimes no matter what it looks like, 
if it doesn't taste good, you're not going to like it. Attitude is that taste. Attitude is what builds a home sweet home. Learn this. Uptight families cease to function properly. Your children can detect your attitude better than you can. That they can tell whether you're happy on the inside. And here's what I'm not saying be false and be fake around them. As I share with you, I can remember many times that my mom and my dad both were in tears and crying. And, my, and, and there were some times when they had sort of had to hold it all together. Like, you know, don't tell them, you know, like this is, these things are going to happen. There were times when they had to hold it together for us as a family. But there were times when they were honest. When they were like, come on in, let's, let's get into the family. Let's get into the living room. Let me tell you what's going on with the business. Let me tell you what's happening here. Let me tell you what's going on in this situation. And I can remember many times like hiding behind the couch. I could hear what my parents were saying. And in every situation, it was like this, 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 and this. Well, we got to go to God in prayer. I mean, every, without a fail, every time. And of course, my mom was the leader in that. And I can remember that. Every, there, there are times when you have to be honest with your children. Like right now, we're working through this. Right now, mom and dad are trying to figure out how to pray through this. But attitude is what makes that. Don't, don't hide that attitude. Because if you do, if you and I try to hide that attitude, it's going to come out in a critical spirit. It's going to come out in a grumpy spirit. It's going to come out, we're going to start nitpicking them. And they're not going to have a clue in the world why we're acting that way towards them. And you and I have to learn that attitude is what builds a home sweet home. We can't be uptight families. Strong families here have little to do with rigid rules and regulations and everything to do with attitudes and actions. Yes, you need to have rules and regulations in a family. Not saying you shouldn't have them. But they shouldn't be so rigid where you're expecting your child to be better than a major league baseball player who at 30% is considered successful and you're demanding 60, 70, 80%, right? I mean, I, I get that. You do need to have rules and regulations, but it's all on the attitude and the action. Have we not learned this in life and especially going through this season that flexibility is the key? Flexibility is absolutely the key. So we did some things with our house this week, this week, but not what I thought at all. What I thought, what I had planned, and I learned. We learned some new things, like I learned what Instagram Reels are and how to get on that. And we made a really ridiculous, goofy one. I thought last night, just having fun with it. But I had other things in mind. Well, some things changed in our family dynamic this week. Won't go into detail on that, but just um, we, things changed in the family dynamic and and. Yeah, anyway, just a lot happened this week. Rain has been picking up the extra load in some areas, and we've just been worn out. Things have changed, and I'm sitting there thinking, well, I had this schedule, and I kind of thought we would do this. Totally didn't get to do that this week, but that's okay. We were supposed to sort of celebrate family, I thought, kind of this way. We ended up doing like on a little 15-second Instagram reels or whatever. It's still okay, right? Flexibility is absolutely the key. Psalm 46, verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exhausted among the nations, exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, the New American Standard Version says, cease striving. I love that. That there comes a time when you have to learn to let off the gas when it comes to relationships and just focus more on the attitude and just sit back and relax. There are times when things aren't going to go like they should. And flexibility is the key at that moment just to sit back and take a breath. John chapter 8, verse 36. So if the Son sets you free, listen, you will be free indeed. Now listen, John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now watch. Let me put these two verses together for you. We were made, families were made, we were made, we were made for love, joy, peace, freedom, and fullness. That's what we were made for. Do you understand that? Listen, that's what we were made for. The family should reflect these spiritual blessings. Do you get that? Remember, the family is God's gift to the world to model to a lost world what it means to live for and live in Christ. When Joshua crossed the Jordan River and camped at Gilgal, Jericho was within sight. You have to know that listening for 40 years of walking through the desert, when God said the promised land, you know they thought of some beachside resort, right? I mean, I would. Land flowing with milk and honey. And I, I mean, I'm thinking of all these condominiums on, on kind of New Smyrna Beach. Like, woohoo, this is going to be awesome. 
And then you come to Camp Gilgal and you look and there's Jericho and you're like, wait, what? This isn't the view that I thought. You ever been there? Like, God, I know you got me through the river, but this is not the view that I thought it would be. How God said they would conquer the land of new moons, new festivals, new customs, and new gods. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, how he said they would do that is come together as a family and teach these principles. That is how that new land would know who that God is. I told you last Sunday, and I still believe it, the dysfunctional family is the number one problem in America today. I really believe that. Because if we would get the family back to the concept that God has delivered it to be, we would see a change because it's what God gave to Joshua in the new land on how to conquer that land. So how do we do this? Number three, let's close with this. How do we do this? Be authentic. Mom and dad, just be authentic. One of the best things I can remember from my parents is they were real. They were authentic. Life stinks. Life is hard. Life is this. Life is that. But this is how we will respond. Be absolutely authentic. Your children, your family are learning how to process their emotions by how you process your emotions. And if they grow up and don't know how to process their emotions, you can't as much blame all of it on them. Some of it is yours. Now, hang on. Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way they will go. When they were old, they will not depart from it. I get that. There is a level where you're not responsible for the decisions they make. You can only do your part to say, this is how you make decisions. But when they start making them outside of those boundaries, right? You understand that. You're with me on that? But be authentic. Number two, stay fluid. Stay fluid. Flexibility is the key. And number three, laugh a lot. Laugh a lot. Okay, so our family has gone through a number of diets. I'm going to give you a stress diet this morning. I want you to watch this. I'm going to give you a stress diet, give you a helpful... A way to eat this week. For breakfast, have half a grapefruit, a piece of toast, and eight ounces of milk. For lunch, eat four ounces of chicken, one cup of steamed vegetables, one chocolate chip cookie, and some herbal tea. This is a stress diet. Mid-afternoon snack. Read the rest of the package of chocolate chip cookies, <laughs> one quart of chocolate fudge brownie ice cream, and one container of marshmallow fluff. For dinner... Two loaves of garlic bread, one large pizza, three Milky Ways. Eat the entire frozen cheesecake eaten directly from the freezer with a Diet Coke. You hear the laughter? Did you hear the laughter? That's a home sweet home. That diet's not for real. Some of you are going, dang, Pastor Juan, you saw what I eat every week. I'm sorry. Maybe parts of that. So here's this week's family challenge. I love to laughter. That's why we read that. Here, here's the challenge. Here's the family challenge this week. Kids, you're going to love this. This week, you pick a day when you eat dessert first before the meal. And mom and dad are going, Pastor Ron, that was my, that was my lesson this week with little Johnny. We don't do that. Now you're destroying that. I get, I'm sorry. If you don't want to do that, here's the, here's the challenge this week. Take some time this week and make an award-winning dessert, whatever it is. You pick it, you make it, you create it, but make an award-winning dessert. But here's the lesson. The lesson is not so much the dessert you're making. You're teaching your children through making the dessert what a home sweet home looks and sounds and hears like through your words. You might think you're building a dessert, but you're actually building a moment that teaches them what a home sweet home looks like. So you get to have dessert first one day this week. You say, just one day? If you want to do it every day, do it every day. It's your house. It's your house. Our God has called us to make a home sweet home. When the rest of the world is soured, our light may just be laughter. Our light may just be encouragement. Our light may just be the smell of something different, the aroma of love. This is how you build a home sweet home. Amen? Would you pray with me? Father, I want to thank you for this message, as simple as it is. But God, if we could learn the simple power of, of encouraging words, if we could learn the simple power of supportive, of loving words, if we could, if we could learn the smell of home, the smell of encouragement, the smell of respect, the smell of accountability and responsibility. 
And Father, I pray right now for maybe the mom or the dad that that's their, that's their biggest challenge. Their biggest challenge is, is, is trying to choose the right words. Their biggest challenge is trying to be encouraging. Maybe, the, maybe a friend of theirs is better. Maybe a spouse or partner is the better one in it. Father, I pray right now that you would help us build sweeter homes. Because our home in our neighborhood is a living example of what it means to live with a heavenly Father who loves us, who encourages us, who supports us. So may our homes today reflect that, God. Lord, teach us this week in building a dessert that our words actually empower those around us to be who you've called them to be. So, Father, my prayer is as much time as we put into a recipe this week, let us put as much time into the words that we're using around others. And, Father, monitor us, measure us. As the psalmist says, put a guard on my mouth before words come out of my lips. Let us engage our mind before we open our mouth. And how do we do that best? By getting the word of God in us. Just as we absorb the word, the the word absorbs us. Father, you do this. Build strong families this week and let it be with the words that we use. And my prayer is that we hear sweet words from you. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we stand this morning?